let me talk about obviously the main the main subject that's on a lot of people's minds, the subject that uh, that concerns obviously Israelis and a lot of Israel's friends in America, and that is the threat of an Iranian nuclear bomb. Um, we've been through. I would call it a fascinating period, except that it's, we're, we're too close to it, to, to, and it's too fraught to actually just be fascinating. Fascinating implies a kind of distance to it. Um, but it has been a remarkable couple of weeks on this subject. We've had um, what I, I, you know, everybody, in the, in, in, everybody was referring to this as the charm offensive by the Iranian president. I call it Operation Offensive Charm um, uh, because I didn't believe it. Uh, I mean, we, we saw over the last week or so, uh, starting right before Rosh Hashanah, when Iranian leaders started tweeting Rosh Hashanah greetings to the Jewish people, and a lot of people who should be a little bit more cynical than, than they were said, oh, see, it's proof they don't hate us. And I say, you know, it doesn't take a lot to send a tweet. It really doesn't. Um, I do it all the time. It really doesn't take a lot of effort. And then we saw, obviously, the new Iranian president come to New York and, and basically wow people by essentially, and this is the way I point out, by not being Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. I mean, what we forgot during this charm offensive was that he had an incredibly low bar to get over because his predecessor was a lunatic Holocaust denier. So anybody who comes from Iran who is not a lunatic Holocaust denier, although he has his own issues with the Holocaust, obviously, but he's too smart to unveil them in the same way. Anybody who comes and is not a Holocaust denier and seems like a lunatic is going to get a lot of good press, and he got a little good press. And obviously, the phone call between the American president and the Iranian president as he was leaving New York was a very large deal uh, and very consequential. And yes, these are positive developments if you believe that the Iranians are sincere. I want to talk about this issue for a second because I think it's the most crucial of the moment. Then I'll get to why this is a threat, but the reason I doubt the Iranians when they say they want to give up their nuclear program or hint or suggest that they are ready to negotiate an end to the, the nuclear program um, is because it's not in their best interest to give up their nuclear program. One of the things you try to do in my job is put yourself in the shoes of the people you're writing about. Even if you don't happen to like them or agree with them, you try to understand the world the way they see the world. Now, if you're the leader of Iran, you have two problems. One is the sanctions that President Obama and the administration have put on Iran you know, and, and layered them on over the past four years that are really hurting the economy. So you've got to figure out a way to get out of those sanctions. That's why they started the charm offensive. If there had been no pressure and no sanctions and no threat of military force, there'd be no need for Iran to talk about compromise. Now balance that issue, the, the need to get out from under these crippling sanctions, with this observation. If you're the Iranian leader, you look at the world around you and you see hostility on every border. Uh, you see a, a, a world that is dominated, a Middle East that's dominated by Sunni Muslims, who are your enemy, who see you as an adversary. Saudi Arabia, the entire Gulf region, Egypt, all the way through Morocco. These are your adversaries. So you're surrounded by them. You have them to your east in Afghanistan. You have them across the Middle East. You see Turkey, which is a rival regional superpower. You see, of course, the Jewish state, for which you have a pathological, irrational hatred, and you see the Jewish state not as the target of your invective, but as a danger to your existence, because the Jewish state, you know, has nuclear weapons. And since you assume the worst about Jews, you assume that they want to kill you. Um, ultimately, of course, you see the presence in the Middle East as the main power in the Middle East of the United States, which is the great Satan from your perspective, the, your, your, your singular enemy and something that you have to guard against every way and every, in, in every day. Um, and so you look at the world and you say, you know what? This is a dangerous combination of countries that are lined up against me. I have to defend myself. Conventional weapons don't do it. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a very simple point. If, you, if you're an Iranian leader and you look at the history of the last 10 years, let me just walk through this for a minute because it seems so obvious when you talk about it. In 2003, President George W. Bush 
who had previously identified an axis of evil. Remember that expression? Seems like another age, but, but, it, but, it, but it's still current in the Iranian mind. You, you, you identify Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, okay? George W. Bush decides to invade Iraq. There are many reasons for this. The Iranians asked themselves the question, why did they invade Iraq and not, say, North Korea? Because in Iraq, the Americans knew, and again, this is the way an Iranian leader might think, the, 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 the Americans knew that the Iraqis, that Saddam Hussein, did not have a nuclear weapon. North Korea was a nuclear power. You don't invade a nuclear power. Jump forward several years. Muammar Gaddafi decides after the Gulf War that he doesn't want a weapons of mass destruction program anymore. He doesn't want nuclear weapons. It doesn't seem to be helping him in any way. So he reaches out to the West and he tells the Western powers, you know what, I do have a nuclear program. I don't want it anymore. Take it away from me. So it was taken away. He gave it up and it was physically, the components of this program were physically moved to the United States. They're in Tennessee right now. You can go visit them. Um, and, and, and what did Gaddafi get in, in exchange for that? He got diplomatic relations with the West. He got an open economy. Then there was a little rebellion. And as soon as the rebellion started, the West turned on him in a flash. This is the way the Iranians see it again. The West turned on Gaddafi uh, and you know how he ended up after a NATO invasion after NATO airstrikes. Um, and, and if you're the Iranian leadership, you look at that situation and say, the reason Gaddafi is no longer in power is because he didn't have nuclear weapons. No one would have dared invade Libya if he had had that power. So it makes sense if you're an Iranian leader to want nuclear weapons for defensive purposes. For offensive purposes, you want this as well. The Iranians are a regional imperial power. They believe that they have a message that needs to go across the Muslim Middle East. They want to be the leaders of, of, of global Islam. They have a vision for the way the world should be organized. And in order to organize the world in that way, they need maximum power. What is ultimate power in this world? Ultimate power is the possession of a nuclear arsenal. Um, so it makes sense from an offensive and defensive capability. So then you ask yourself, okay, why are they talking so seemingly sincerely about giving them up, and I go back to the sanctions. It's one thing and one thing only. They need to get out of this while at the same time progressing on their nuclear program. I'll issue this caveat right now because it's important to say, not only could I be wrong, I hope I'm wrong. I mean, it's very important to say, I hope I'm wrong because it would be a wonderful thing for the United States, and it would be a wonderful thing for Israel if the Iranians had had a change of heart. If they had decided, you know what, I don't need this. We don't need this. Our economy is broken. We don't need these kind of weapons. They will just cause catastrophe for us. Therefore, I want to give them up. And I'd be very, very happy if I had to come back here in a couple of years or three years and say, you know what, my analysis of the Iranian leadership was wrong. They actually wanted to get rid of this. And hallelujah. Because, and I'll come to this in a minute, in when I talk about some of the other threats facing Israel. My general belief is that only the Jews can defeat the Jews. If you are sitting on a synagogue board, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> only Jews can generally defeat the Jews. We're not that easy to defeat as a, as a people, but I would make an exception and say that Iran with a nuclear bomb would actually pose an existential threat to Israel. So now that I've tried to establish the idea that what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is chimerical, that, that, that we will see some progress, and people, you might want to put it in scare quotes or not, we will see progress in these negotiations, but I think at the end of the day, Iran, Iran's goal is to maintain the core of its nuclear program so that it can build a nuclear weapon if it decides it needs it. Why is that such a devastating thing for, for Israel? Because after all, as I noted, even though Israelis won't know this publicly, Israel has a large nuclear arsenal, and we know that Israel is a very powerful military force in the Middle East, the most potent air force in the Middle East. Why is this such a problem? Let me walk through a couple of reasons why Israel's existence would be called into question. And I, I use these words carefully. Israel's existence would be called into question if Iran becomes a nuclear power. The first most obvious reason, and, and the question that people most often ask themselves is, would Iran use a nuclear weapon on Israel? In other words, they, on a Tuesday, the Supreme Leader says, okay, turn the screw, 
put the missile, put the, put the, put the bomb on a missile and fire it at Tel Aviv. Um, is, that, is, that a, is there a high likelihood of that? No. There's not a high likelihood of that at all. Because you have to think that even though this regime seems irrational sometimes, it knows the consequence of doing that, which could be an Israeli retaliatory strike. So I don't believe that that is a high likelihood. I believe that it's plausible, however, and, and to describe why I believe that's plausible, let me step back and talk about the Cold War, where we had a whole bunch of nuclear missiles pointed at us and we had pointed at the Soviets. What was the saving grace of the Soviet system? The saving grace for me of the Soviet system that it was run by atheists. It was run by atheists. Now, if you're an atheist, you believe that this world is the only world in which you exist. There's nothing that comes after. And so you have a desire to stay alive and, 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 and extend this life as long as possible. Many of the leaders of the Iranian regime, and the regime obviously has its shares of politicians and cynics, and I assume even secret non-believers, but this is a religious, religiously fundamentalist regime. I don't want nuclear weapons in the hands of anyone, but I especially don't want nuclear weapons in the hand of religious fundamentalists. Why? For the very obvious reason that religious fundamentalists, especially of the sort that have so much power in Iran, believe that this world is simply the anteroom to the next. In other words, what, what happens in, in this world is fine, but there's something better down the road. And not only that, that, that getting to that place through martyrdom is especially holy. And so if you are a religious fundamentalist with a nuclear weapon, you might think to yourself, you know what? I might die if I use this weapon, but I don't care that much because I think what's coming next is better. And I think I'm gonna be in great shape with God in heaven because I've done something holy from my perspective, which is to destroy the Jewish state which in their state theology is an affront against God. Like I said, I don't think it's a highly plausible scenario that the Iranians will get a nuclear weapon and then fire it at Tel Aviv or try to smuggle it in Tel Aviv and blow it up. But I do worry about the idea of nuclear weapons in the hands of any religious fundamentalist. Um, point number one is almost irrelevant when I introduce you to point number two that I don't necessarily think that there will be a purposeful exchange of nuclear weapons in the Middle East should Iran go nuclear, but I think there's a high likelihood that we could have an accidental, accidental escalation toward a nuclear war before anyone has the ability or sense to stop it. And what do, what do I mean by that? I, this is what I mean as, as follows. We know that Iran's most potent ally, non-state ally in the Middle East is Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a, a Shia, terrorist organization based in Lebanon. Israel has been through multiple confrontations and a couple of wars with, with Hezbollah in 2006. You remember there was a, there was a, a war. Hezbollah at the time had 30,000 rockets. Today, after being defeated in that war, it has 100,000 rockets. And these rockets are not pointed everywhere in the world. They're pointed at one country. They're pointed at Israel, and they could reach most parts of Israel at, at this point. We know that Hezbollah is an aggressive organization. We know that it is an anti-Semitic organization. We know that its stated goal is to destroy the Jewish state. Um, imagine the following scenario. In a Middle East in which Iran has gone nuclear, Hezbollah fires a rocket into Israel. It wouldn't be the first time. It wouldn't be the 10th time, in fact. Hezbollah fires some rockets into Israel. They strike Haifa. They, God forbid, kill a couple of people. Israel responds, as Israel always does, by trying to blow up the, the locations where the rockets are being fired from or attacking Hezbollah positions in South Lebanon. Hezbollah, of course, retaliates against the Israeli retaliation by sending even more rockets, more rockets into Israel. Israel decides, well, you know what? We can't just do this from the air. We have to go in on the ground. This is a scenario that we've seen obviously over and over again. Israeli troops cross the border with tanks, with infantry, and they go start hunting for the Hezbollah rocket squads. It's at that moment, that we've seen that scenario before, but let me introduce you to the new, the new reality if Iran gets a nuclear weapon. The new reality is as follows. Israeli intelligence watching Iran, or maybe even American intelligence watching Iran, sees something going on on an Iranian Air Force base, or Iranian missile sites. 
most countries, and I assume Iran would be no different, keep their nuclear weapons demated. They sometimes keep the triggers out of the warhead. Sometimes they just keep the warhead separate from the delivery system. It's a basic means to, to, to keep your nuclear weapons as safe as possible. Let's say that the Israelis and the Americans learn that two days after this Hezbollah-Israel war or skirmish has started, the Iranians decide to move some warheads closer to the launch sites, to the missiles. Or they, they see that the missiles themselves are being fueled. Or they see the alarm go off in various Iranian bases associated with the missile fleet and with the nuclear apparatus. You're the Israeli prime minister. What do you do then? It seems as if Iran is preparing nuclear weapons for launch. Now, step back for one moment and ask yourselves this. What is the fundamental job of the Israeli prime minister? The fundamental job of the Israeli prime minister is to prevent a second holocaust. When you, when you, when you remove everything else that a, a, a leader of a modern nation state does, the job of the Israeli prime minister as the leader of the state that is the concrete manifestation of the idea that the Jews will not go easily to the next slaughter, you're the leader of that country, and you see a country that has threatened to seek your destruction, that believes that you don't have a right to exist, you see that country moving nuclear components in a way that suggests they might use them. What do you do? It's a nightmare scenario, and it's a nightmare scenario that could come to pass if Iran goes nuclear. One other thing that I want to fold into this, into this nightmare, have I depressed you enough yet? Because I'm trying as hard as I can. Um, one other, one other factor that you have to fold into this, which I think is so interesting. If Iran goes nuclear, if Iran goes nuclear, there are two or three or four other countries in the Middle East that will go nuclear. Because remember, Iran has a lot of enemies in the Middle East. One of the miracles of Iran is that it has made Saudi Arabia and Israel into tacit allies. Um, it, that's not so easy to achieve. Somehow the government of Iran has done that. The Saudis and Israelis can't admit that, of course, but they have the same exact overlapping goals. The number one goal is to stop Iran from going, going nuclear. So, so Saudi Arabia, which sees Iran as, a, as its key rival, doesn't see Israel as its key rival. Israel's almost an irrelevancy in the day-to-day -day thinking of the Saudis. Saudi Arabia goes nuclear. It doesn't have to go nuclear by, by sending scientists to the MIT for 10 years. It can go to Pakistan and buy nuclear weapons off the shelf because the Saudis funded that in the first place. The United Arab Emirates could decide that it needs nuclear protection. Turkey will certainly decide that, well, if the Iranians, who are the successors of the Persian Empire, have a nuclear weapon, then, then the Turks, who are the successors of the Ottoman Empire, certainly will have to have nuclear weapons. Egypt, not the dysfunctional Egypt of today, but in Egypt two or three or four years down the road, might decide that it too needs, because it's the leader of the Arab world, it too needs to have the protection of a nuclear program. So then what you have is a nuclear arms race in the world's most volatile region. Imagine a situation in which four or five countries in a pretty tight space are all pointing nuclear missiles at each other. There's no margin for error in that. It's a very, very devastating problem, and it's a problem that Israel has to confront. There's no way around that. You can be a left-winger on Palestinian issues or a right-winger on Palestinian issues. It's not relevant to this discussion because Iran is not a, 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 Iran's position and until they change their position, we have to believe that this is their position, is that they seek the destruction of the state of Israel. Um, there's one other point, which is a slightly more subtle point about Iran that has to be understood. Why is Israel a successful country? And it is successful. It's economically successful. It's technologically successful. It's militarily successful. It's socially successful. It's culturally successful. Uh, why, despite all of its problems, and we'll talk about those in a second, why is it successful? Because of what in Hebrew is called the Homer Ben Adam, the, 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 the human material. Doesn't have, well, now they're discovering oil, probably a little bit too late, but they're discovering a lot of oil. But, but its, basic, its basic building blocks is, is, are, are brains. Um, I've had many conversations with friends of mine who are Israeli, who, when they think about this problem, when they think about a Middle East in which multiple countries, including adversarial countries, have nuclear weapons and threaten Israel's existence, they say to themselves, you know what, I love my country, 
I send my children to the army, I want to live here and I want to die here, but maybe this isn't such a great place for my children after the army. Maybe just to be safe, we should have a foothold in the United States or we should have a foothold in Europe. It's impossible to blame them because the instinct of any parent would be to say, you know what, if I have a choice of having my child in a country that lives under this nuclear cloud or not, maybe I'll have my child live elsewhere. And so what does that mean? It means that, it means that the most mobile Israelis, the most internationally oriented Israelis, the ones who could land on their feet anywhere in the world, might seek to land on their feet somewhere else in the world. That's devastating for Israel, obviously, because Israel is only as good as its people. And if the best, most talented people who are responsible for all these miracles decide that the Middle East is just too unpleasant a place to live, they might decide to leave. It's a more subtle problem than obviously the problem of an accidental nuclear escalation leading to a nuclear exchange, but it's a problem nonetheless. Um, look, first of all, we have to acknowledge what we don't know, which is most everything. We don't even know that for sure that the Iranians don't have the capability of putting together a nuclear bomb in three weeks. We're not, we're not, you need to remember, remember the whole, this whole drama over the last eight or 10 years was accelerated when we kept discovering that they had secret facilities they were hiding from the International Atomic Energy Agency, right? So, so just because we've, you know, we think that we've discovered all the secret facilities, well, what if they're secret facilities that haven't been discovered? So, so we don't even know that. But let's assume for the moment that at this moment in time that the Iranians are at least several months away from having a nuclear weapon should the supreme leader of Iran decide that he needs one. Let's assume that. Uh, I think you give Obama and negotiations time. I, I don't think, I think five years ago, he probably, as president, coming in on this wave of adulation, thought, I can convince anybody of anything, and so I can negotiate with these guys, and I'm just gonna approach them differently. I don't think he's, he's naive about the Iranians at all. Um, what, I worry about is that he, like everyone else in his business, is a politician and would be tempted by what seems to be an easy solution. In other words, give the Iranians something uh, in exchange for promises um, that would be very hard to guarantee. So that's where, again, it becomes a problem in four or six months from now. But I would time limit it. I would say, look, we're going to go to negotiations. Everything's on the table. But you have to do X, Y, and Z. And these are difficult things for you to do. But if you do them, then we're going to liberate your economy. And we'll know fairly quickly. That's the whole idea of a time-limited negotiation. We'll know fairly quickly if they're serious or not. Um, if they're not serious, then you keep on with the sanctions. And then Obama has to face down the road the choice, you know, are they getting so close that I have to stop them militarily, or do I give Netanyahu, the secret green light to go try to do it himself. My assumption is that both the Iranians and the American administration would like to kick, this, kick the can down the road quite a bit, um, which is to say Iran wants to be this close to having a nuclear weapon without doing anything too aggressive, and Obama would like them to be that close without doing anything aggressive so he can avoid the subject of having to bomb them at all. Because remember, and this is the, this is the I think it's a, a key observation about President Obama, he was the president elected to not invade Muslim countries. His predecessor was the one who invaded Muslim countries. It didn't work out so well. He came into office. He's in office because George W. Bush invaded one too many Muslim countries. And so everything in Obama's personality, everything in his political outlook says, do not get sucked into a war with Iran. His behavior, his wavering, hesitant behavior, which I think is a fair judgment, during the Syria crisis is evidence that he's extremely reluctant to go open up new fronts, new hostile fronts in the Muslim world. And I don't think the way that Syria thing happened was a very healthy way to have these things happen. It didn't make us look strong or, or resolute or, or smart, but at the end of the day, we're not at war right now in Syria, and for the majority of Americans, that's a good thing. And maybe for this issue that we're talking about, the Iran issue, it's a good thing, because if he had been drawn into Syria, and then six months from now, or a year from now, tells the American people, oh, also, by the way, I'm also gonna start attacking Iran soon, that would be too much to bear. And, and I think that the president, although I think that many 
aspects of that issue were mishandled, I think the president has a very good sense in his own mind of what's important in the Middle East. And there are really only two national security issues that, that trouble him greatly. One is the continued existence of al-Qaeda, and we see that he is no vegetarian, as they say, when it comes to fighting al-Qaeda. And the second is preventing Iran from crossing the nuclear threshold, and he has worked on that problem assiduously as well. But again, it's too early to tell whether his plan has worked. What would happen if Israel, if Netanyahu decides at, at the end of the day, whenever that is, next year, the year after, that he has to go bomb the Iranian nuclear program uh, despite President Obama's demand that he not do it? I mean, that's the, obviously, the obvious answer is that it creates the mother of all crises between Israel and the United States. Um, I'll tell you, a, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a funny story, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it gives you an insight into the Middle East. I once asked uh, an official of an Arab country, I won't name the person or the country, but I once said, how do you want this to play out? How do you want this crisis to play out? Because remember, you know, we know this from, from WikiLeaks, if nothing else, that the Arab states are more worried about an Iranian nuclear bomb than, than Israel. Uh, and so this person said, well, what, we, what ideally should happen is that Israel should attack the Iranian nuclear program, but only succeed partially in destroying the program, which would force the United States to come in and finish the job, which would, at the end of this process, would leave the United States, United States really mad at Israel, but Iran without a nuclear program, so we look good. Uh, I said, well, that's the Middle East, you know, and, that, and that's, you know, the mood in this country right now is, uh, as you know, I mean, we were having a discussion before whether you could call it isolationist or just fatigued or, or, or whatever. I don't think the mood in this country would be so great for that at this moment. I mean, we know that Israel remains a popular cause with many Americans and that, and that many Americans see Israel's defense as an issue worthy of American attention in a way that they obviously didn't believe that Syria was worth that level of attention. Um, if the Iranians are dumb, they will attack American targets in response to an Israeli attack on their nuclear program. By dumb, what I mean is if the, if the Iranians responded by attacking American targets, America has no, no uh, recourse but to respond. Um, and, and the American Air Force and American capabilities are obviously much greater than the Israeli capabilities. Um, one of the surprises, I think, for President Obama, uh, and, and you might have to ask him five or 10 years down the, down the road this, um, one of the surprises, I think, for him is that Netanyahu actually did listen to him when Netanyahu said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. There are many moments in the last three years where Netanyahu was leaning to doing it, and the Americans said, absolutely not, I got this. Remember, uh, I mean, I actually, last year I interviewed President Obama in which, in, in, in which he said, you know, I, as an American president, I don't bluff, and I, when I say I have Israel's back, I have Israel's back. Uh, and Netanyahu bought it. And, and the reason he bought it is because he knows how important America is to Israel's national security. So yes, Netanyahu went to the UN a couple of days ago and said, if we have to do it alone, we'll do it alone. But what I've noticed about Netanyahu over the years is that when he, he makes the loudest, most militant noises when he's not gonna do the thing, uh, which is good politics, I suppose. But see, when he did that, I thought to myself, okay, he's not gonna do anything for the next while. Because he's because he, he's because he's very key on he's very keen on keeping it as a as a, as an option that's alive. But he wouldn't be talking about it the same way if in three weeks he was going to call President Obama and say I'm going to go out to bomb uh, Iran. Um, but I think that if it happened, it all depends on if it worked or not. If it worked and it happened in the middle of the night and they managed to do some damage to the Iranian nuclear program, then a lot of Americans would say good. Um, I think President Obama would be infuriated. I don't know how much room he has to maneuver against Israel because Congress would probably be, come out and say, we're for this. President Obama might come out and say, 
look, we are for this because, you know, we, we, Israel is an independent nation that judged its security to be threatened by the Iranian nuclear program, so did this. Um, if the Iranians are smart, they would respond to an Israeli attack by attacking maybe Israeli targets or attacking Jewish targets around the world, as they have done in the past, but not damaging American targets. And if they were really smart, they wouldn't do a thing and simply go to the UN and go to the world community and say, look at this, we've done nothing to anyone and we got attacked. Therefore, this proves our need for a nuclear deterrent. I mean, this is the problem, and this is why I'm opposed to an Israeli attack. You know, an Israeli attack would, might actually destroy some aspects of the Iranian nuclear program, but it would prove to the Iranians and prove to many people around the world who are on the fence that Iran is under threat. And so I think that the sanctions would dissolve. Certainly Russia and China wouldn't participate anymore in the sanctions if Israel attacked Iran preemptively. And I, I think that, that, that Iran would be in a position to then rush for a bomb and be able to say to itself and to the rest of the world, well, look, we need a bomb because we're being attacked by the Jewish country. And so, so, so it's a very, very dicey, terrible situation. Look, we talked about, I talked about existential threats facing Israel. There are existential threats facing the Iranian regime. One is the fear of all of these enemies surrounding it who want to get rid of it. The second is that economic instability leads to widespread dissatisfaction among the people. You know, we saw levels of dissatisfaction among the people in 2009 when the election was stolen. The regime has a response to that, which is to kill large numbers of its own citizens, um, and they were successful in that. Uh, but obviously, there are many millions of Iranians. Who, look, Iranians are a very pro-American population. 30 years of rule by these Islamist clerics will, will do that to a group of people. Um, so, um, so, you know, so clearly the regime is worried about that happiness and stability uh, of its people. And so, you know, the, look, the reigning, the theory of the Obama administration, and it's premature to say that this is wrong, the theory is that enough economic pressure will force Iran to give up its nuclear program because it faces, it, it's, it's facing a difficult choice. Give up the nuclear program and risk, risk being understood as weak and vulnerable, or don't give up the nuclear program but have your economy suffocated to the point where your people revolt against you. Um, but you know, we're in the, I mean, it seems like this, this issue has been going on forever, but we're still in the part, we're still in the first act of the drama in a way, because we don't know yet the true impact of these sanctions. We don't really know what's in the hearts of the Iranian leadership, and we don't know if more economic pressure is the thing that would make them say, okay, fine, we give up. Because these two things pose, pose a threat. So this is why, you know, it's, um, I get, I, sometimes I get criticized by, by more right-wing friends for, for, for defending the sanctions program and the patience that has gone into the sanctions program. And I said, you know, we don't know yet. We don't know yet, but it seems like they're, 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 they're suffering uh, and, and that the people would be unhappy with it. I want to talk about a couple of other things very quickly, and, and I alluded to the, the, the Palestinian issue before. Uh, I might sound hawkish on the Iran issue. I'm going to sound dovish on the Palestinian issue. This is another existential threat. It's not an existential threat in the next month or two or three or six. But it's an existential threat all, all the same. There has to be a way for Israel to remain a Jewish majority democracy. If you believe in the mission of Israel, which is to be a haven for a wounded and damaged people who lived as a minority for 2,000 years in societies that did not want them, if you believe that that's still an important mission, then you support the idea of a Jewish homeland, a Jewish state. If you are like me, an American who is inculcated in the values of this country uh, and the values of democracy, then you want Israel to remain a democracy. Israel is on a path where it's either going to be a Jewish state or a democratic state, but the pathway that it's on is not a healthy one. This is not an immediate problem. I mean, there are some people who argue that it was a problem 10 years ago, but it's, it, it's not something that you're looking at tomorrow, but decisions have to be made and they're very, very difficult decisions. Either you disengage yourself from the, untangle yourself from the lives of two million Palestinians on the West Bank who don't want to be controlled by Israel, or you have to give them the vote inside Israel, which would 
make Israel a non-Jewish state in a short period of time. There's really no choice. It's, 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 to me, it's, 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 it's a complete bifurcation. Either you go in one direction or you go in the other direction. But at a certain point, and I don't know if that point is five years from now, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, this will become an enormous crisis when Israel has to face the challenge of staying Jewish and staying democratic at the same time. I would prefer the creation of a Palestinian state. That way Palestinians can have their own lives and they could build their own country with their own nationality. The Jews couldn't continue to exist in their Jewish homeland. Um, obviously, at this point, you're thinking, oh, that's a lovely thought, but there hasn't been much proof that this would work. I would offer two observations. The first is that, yes, this seems like a pretty terrible idea, a two-state solution right now, but it's better than all the other ideas. The second observation I would make is that since there is no choice, that, that Israel has to find interim steps to bring about this change. It means not pulling out unilaterally from the West Bank. I've had this conversation with Israelis, and, and the conversation usually starts this way. Is that why, I always ask, why is there no left anymore in Israel? There's a very small left. There's a few seats in Knesset and, uh, you know, uh, obviously some newspaper columnists who argue that everything is Israel's fault. If Israel just took X step or Y step or Z step, everything would be fine. There are very few people who argue that anymore. And there's a good reason for that. Look at the map of Israel right now. Look at what it's surrounded by. In the Sinai Peninsula, which, of course, Israel ceded back to Egypt quite a while ago, Today, there are Al-Qaeda organizations firing rockets into Eilat. If you go to the north in Lebanon, Israel, acceding to the demands of the international community, pulled out of Lebanon in 2000. What happened in South Lebanon? Hezbollah came in and started firing rockets. Gaza, in 2005, Ariel Sharon decided that it would, because he wanted to preserve a Jewish democracy, he decided that the best thing for Israel to do would be get out of Gaza. What happened when they got out of Gaza? Rockets from Hamas. If you're an Israeli, you look at the map and you look at the reality that surrounds you and you say to yourself, there's no way I can get out of the West Bank right now. This is the, this is the excruciating dilemma for Israel at this moment. What do I, I can't leave and I can't stay. What has to happen, in my humble opinion, is that Israel has to disentangle itself from the lives of as many Palestinians as possible, create the framework on the ground for an eventual withdrawal, and then hope that doing so strengthens the hands of the Palestinian moderates, who are usually almost always on their back feet, uh, and then work toward a gradual disengagement from the West Bank. To me, it's the only way to save the idea of a Jewish democratic state. You know, if these negotiations progress, there will be land swaps. You know, there are settlement blocks that are right up on the border of the Green Line of Israel proper, and that those are so heavily populated that they will, in all likelihood, go to Israel in exchange for land, unoccupied Israeli land that could be attached to a Palestinian state. Um, I mean, what you don't want to create is a, is a Palestinian state that's not viable because it's not contiguous or, uh, you know, because it's separated by... Uh, Israeli highways or Israeli security zones. That's not really a recipe for success. It's particularly not a recipe for success because no Palestinian would accept it. I mean, it is an open question in the minds of a lot of people whether Palestinians will even accept a state on the West Bank and then give up their claims to the rest of what is today Israel. They're certainly not going to accept a state on 40 or 50 percent of of the land. And this is, you know, one of the reasons I think this is, I mean, I think peace is possible. I don't think it's available right now for a whole host of reasons. One of the reasons is because Israel and this very, very dangerous, unstable moment in the Middle East is not going to withdraw its forces from the Jordan Valley, which, which of course protects both Israel and the stability of their Jordanian government, the Jordanian system. You know, the, Israeli, the, 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 the people who don't want Israel to leave the Jordan Valley are the Jordanians also, don't forget that. A third intifada hasn't happened yet. The second intifada obviously was disastrous for Israel from a human standpoint, but it was disastrous from the Palestinians from a political standpoint. Um, you know, the, if you're a right-wing Israeli, you have to be worried about the Palestinian authority and, 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 the, and the movement because as they move toward 
more sophisticated strategies like international delegitimization or seeking recognition in the UN uh, or boycott and divestment um, rather than blowing up buses, um, these, are, these are smarter strategies um, and you know, probably should have been used all along. If you were Palestinian, you, know, you could probably look back on the last 20 years and say, well, that didn't really work out, so we're gonna find something else. Anything is possible, there are triggering incidents that you that we don't know about that will will happen that could set off widespread violence in some way um it seems like we're beyond that but i can't answer i mean i can't answer with surety obviously because nothing's happened yet i mean the thing that i worry about uh more than that is the collapse of the palestinian authority entirely if negotiations don't progress in a in a useful way it's already a weak authority um, we obviously see that in the Middle East, it's very easy to create zones of chaos where there is now order. Um, the, one of the finest, most visionary of the Palestinian leadership, Salam Fayyad, is out of a job precisely because he was so, he, he, he could have been the Ben-Gurion of the Palestinians. Uh, he was building the structures of a state. Uh, and, and he's out for political reasons and reasons having to do with corruption and politics. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't see that, that happening quite yet. And I think like a lot of, and this is another, another point about this, this moment that we're in. I'll give you an example. People worry about the stability of Jordan. Is the king gonna survive? Is he not gonna survive? Um, there's so much hostility. Uh, I think he survives for the same reason that I don't think widespread violence breaks out in the West Bank. I could be 100% wrong. And that reason is very simple, that people in the region look at what went on in Cairo a couple of months ago. They look what's been going on in Syria every day for the last two and a half years. They look at Iraq, where a thousand people died in violence last month. They look at Yemen, they look at Lebanon being destabilized, and they say, we don't want that. We don't want that, we can't sustain, we, we fear that level of violence, and so we're gonna stick with what we have, and we're gonna stick with the status quo, even if we're not happy with it, because the alternative is chaos, and I, I think that's why the West Bank is stable for the moment, but it won't be stable forever if there's no progress at all on the peace track. I think that the Israeli politicians who believe, I just met with one, and I, I said, what's, what's your solution to this problem? Very prominent, very intelligent, uh, right-wing member of the Knesset. And he said, well, my solution is the, is the three-state solution. Um, Gaza becomes affiliated and becomes the responsibility of Egypt. The Arabs of the West Bank become the responsibility of Jordan. Israel keeps all of its settlements and, and everybody sort of has a confederation. And I said, that's a lovely idea. Can you name one Arab who wants that? And he said, look, anything's possible. And I said, so that no, the answer is no, you can't name a single Arab who wants it. You have to be somewhat realistic about what the traffic will bear, what, what people in the region want. You can't give in to, to, to do ideas that, that, uh, that won't be good for your national security. But on the other hand, you, know, you can't make stuff up. And that's why in the midst of all this chaos and the midst of the Iranian threat, Israel has to find a way out of this, this death grip it has, uh, this, 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 terrible, this terrible entanglement with the Palestinians. What they need to talk about Obama and Netanyahu, what they need is, is a, a civil divorce. They don't need marriage. They need, they need to arrange a kind of a divorce. And that's the goal, I think, of anyone in Israel who wants to maintain Israel as a Jewish democracy. One or two more quick points. Um, one of the many reasons why Israel must maintain itself as a Jewish democracy is that it will not have large-scale Jewish support outside of Israel if it goes down a non-democratic path. It's a very simple point, a very, very simple point, and I, and I see this happening in, across, Amer across the American Jewish community today. There is where there used to be unalloyed pride in what Israel was doing. Now, in many sectors of the Jewish community, there's ambivalence. There's concern, there's confusion. People don't know what's going on and they are worried that Israel is moving in a direction that differs from the way they would organize their lives. Now, as American Jews, we have to be very humble about this because it's not our lives that are at stake. We can argue for policies, uh, but we have to remember that we are not gonna be directly affected by those policies if they go wrong. That said, the support of the American Jewish community 
for Israel is a national security issue for the state of Israel. It's not just, oh, look, they sent some Israel bonds and they bought an ambulance and how nice. It's a national security issue because American Jews, as the strongest supporters of Israel in America, help ensure that America remains a pro-Israel country. Without American support, it's very, very hard to imagine Israel surviving and thriving in a very, very dangerous reason. Which brings me to this point about a, another existential threat. It's a much more nuanced and long-term threat. But I, I always think of it this way. The, uh, a lot of you remember the UJA Federation had a slogan for a long time, uh, we are one. That Israel and American Jewry were one. My, my general feeling about slogans like that is that if it were true, you wouldn't have to make it a slogan. You know, it's like you don't come downstairs in the morning and look at your kids and look at your parents and say, we are family. The, the reality is you're family. You don't have to talk about it all the time. There's always been a worry that American Jewry is moving in one direction and Israel is moving in another. And we see that more than ever today. And this is obviously a key worry of mine. Israel is becoming more religious, more parochial, uh, more particularistic. Um, much of this is explicable and even defensible, but it is nevertheless the truth. The American Jewish community, and we see this in recent polls in the Pew poll that everybody's talking about, American Jewry becomes more universalistic, more, more geared toward progressive politics generally. We are moving in different directions and we are not as two communities communicating with each other. And this has profound consequences, not only for Israel, which can't afford to lose the love and friendship and support of the American Jewish community, but it's terrible for the American Jewish community because so much of American Jewish identity and pride is tied up in the miracle of the rebirth of the state of Israel. And so that's another thing I want to put on your, uh, on your menu of, of worries tonight. Um, now that you're deeply in a trough, I want to just end by talking about, about, about what, I, what I think of as the paradox of Jewish existence in the 21st century. Uh, and, and here's the paradox. I just went through a litany of challenges that Israel faces, that American Jewry face. We haven't even touched on the re receding, the impact of a receding America in the Middle East. We haven't even touched on issues like intermarriage and the loss of religious faith in the American Jewish community. We can go on all night. I won't do that. But, but there's, a, there's a litany of woe, right? The paradox of the moment is that the condition of world Jewry has not been better in 2,000 years. Since the destruction of the temple, the second temple, 2,000 years ago, a world Jewry has never had it as good as it has it right now. I mean, if you think about it, it's actually kind of remarkable. Uh, roughly 40, 45% of world Jews live in the reconstituted, reborn, economically and military powerful Jewish state. That Jewish state should not have been born. There's nothing in history to suggest that this happens, that a dead people come back to life. But it happened. And, and because Israel is so strong, it was able to absorb so many millions of deprived and oppressed Jews from so many other countries that for the first time in history, there are no more captive Jewish communities. It's actually a remarkable moment in the history of the Jewish people. There are no more Jews being held against their will in oppressive countries around the world. One of the reasons, apart from the fact that there is a, there's a, there's a, essentially a Jewish ark in the Middle East, a haven for Jews to go to that can take them in and feed them and clothe them and educate them and build them up again to be free and independent and proud Jews. One of the other reasons is that for the first time in the history of the diaspora, you have a country like the United States, where roughly 40% of those, uh, those Jews uh, in the world today live. You have a country that is very much unlike any other diaspora experience, a country where, uh, where Jews are not only accepted, but embraced to the point where the biggest challenge facing the American Jewish community is assimilation. You know the famous the famous uh, expression that, you know, it, it, the problem in America is not that Christians want to kill Jews, is that they want to marry them. Um, it is, as I, we were talking before, it's kind of a caviar problem compared to the Jewish problems that our great-grandparents had in Europe. Uh, so the combination of these two Jewish communities, this, this completely out of the norm 
Jewish community of America that is so powerful economically, so powerful culturally, to the point where American culture in many ways is Jewish culture. I mean, it's not just Jews who watch Seinfeld, obviously. Uh, when you combine that with the free, powerful Jewish state, you, you create a condition in which 85 or 90 percent of world Jewry live in these two remarkable communities, and the rest of the Jews benefit, the ones who are in Europe and South America and Australia, benefit from the, the vibrancy of, of Israel and the vibrancy of the American Jewish community. So this is the central paradox. It's, I can sit here, I can literally sit here for three hours and talk about all of the travails of the Jews. And at the same time, I have to acknowledge that it's never been better. And this is what it's like to be Jewish, I think, is to live with this, con no, to live with this contradiction and, and try to understand it and assimilate it and, and make, make, make it have sense and not be unduly panicked, but, but not be uh, unduly relaxed is one of, the, one of the sort of many tricks of keeping your sanity as a Jewish person. You know, a lot of people look at Jewish history and are made depressed by it because from a certain angle of approach, it looks like uh, an unmitigated series of disasters. And I'm susceptible to that, but I, I have to tell you of this, uh, this experience I had several years ago that really opened my mind to another way of looking at Jewish history, not as a source of woe, but as a source of comfort and, and even hope. I was, uh, we had taken our kids uh, a few years ago to Cairo. This is when you could bring your family to Cairo. I hope it happens again. Um, and uh, our kids were, uh, they're teenagers now. They were not teenagers then. Uh, and we had gone to one of my favorite museums in the world, the Egypt Museum, which some of you probably have been there in the past one of the most remarkable museums in the world. It's basically overstuffed with the glories of Egyptian civilization. Uh, absolutely gorgeous place. Uh, it's a very hot place because it's not air conditioned. So we were scrambling around trying to find a way to get the kids to stop complaining. And so we found our way to the one room in the museum that's air conditioned and that's the mummy room. <laughs> For obvious reasons, you gotta keep them at a certain temperature. Um, and, and we go in the mummy room and right there in the entrance is a glass case uh, and, and there's a, 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 a mummy inside the glass case. And the, the label says, this is the, this is the mummy of Ramses II, Ramses II. And those of you who know these stories know that there's a possibility, again, don't want to overstate this, but there's a possibility that Ramses II, Ramses II, is the Pharaoh from the Exodus story. Yeah, and, and, and there he was in a case, not looking very good. Um, desiccated, the yellow teeth, and the wrapping was coming undone. It just didn't, just didn't look good. Uh, I mean, I guess for 3,500 3, years old, he looked great, but he just didn't look. And, and so I was sort of, you know, struck by that. You know, it, it was, this is soon after Pesach, and, you know, it's a, a Passover's a big deal in my house, um, as my friends remember. Um, and, uh, you know, we talk about the story a lot. And I said to the kids, I said, kids, this is... This, this might very well be the Pharaoh who refused to let our people go. And um, two of my kids, the, 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 the two who are more Weisenheimer than the other one, uh, decide to go over to the case and talk to the Pharaoh. And one, one of them, if I recall correctly, one of them called him a schmuck, which I didn't even know they knew the word. I didn't know they were. And, and the other one made the observation that, you know, you're looking at the Pharaoh, you're dead, but we're still here, which is quite a remarkable and visceral experience. And, you know, and I, I thought about that a lot. I mean, it was a very smart and intuitive thing to, to understand that, you know, we had, we had just talked about this Pharaoh and all of the misery that he caused the Jewish people. And here we are as happy, healthy Jewish people visiting him in a box. Um, and it got me thinking about, about the course of Jewish history. And I, that Pharaoh is, is gone and his empire is gone. And then if you trace it through, trace through all, all of Jewish history, all of the people who have oppressed Jews in one way or the other, from Nebuchadnezzar to Titus and Caligula, uh, through you know, the Crusades and the, and, and the Inquisition, obviously to, the, to Stalin and to the greatest horror of all, Hitler. And, and you, you, you realize that they're all gone and, and, and we're still here. So I, I take a tremendous amount of, of solace in that. I don't know what it means, but I generally believe that there's a purpose to history and that there's a purpose to Jewish survival because 
Jews should not have survived everything that's happened over the past 3,000 years, and yet, and yet we're here. So I look at moments like this when you have, uh, when you have a country like Iran that has as its, as its official policy uh, that the Jewish state should not exist. And I look at the kinds of terror that Israel faces and that Jews face, um, and uh, I think to myself in 15 or 20 years, things are gonna be a lot better and we'll come back to the traditional worries of Jews uh, only being able to defeat themselves, uh, which is something that I think we can manage in a different kind of way. Um, one final, final point, and I only tell this because the bar mitzvah was last uh, Saturday. Uh, I decided, because I'm a little bit of a sadist, to bring my son, who was the, the bar mitzvah boy, to, uh, on a trip that I had to take to Rome and Berlin last month. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, at one point, you can imagine what it was like when, when my son said, can we just limit it to three Holocaust museums today? Um, <laughs> but I took him, he had to write his Devar Torah, uh, and he was overdue to write the Devar Torah, and, I, and I, we woke up one morning and I said, I want to go to Vansi to see the, uh, those of you who know what Vansi is, know it's the, it's the place where, where Eichmann gathered the leaders of the SS and other organizations and tried to, um, and, and, and formulated the plan for the final solution. Um, and I said, you know what, let's go to Vansi, let's go see it, but let's also, you know, why don't you just work on your Devar Torah there? And, and you know, what I was thinking of, of course, was what would Eichmann like least and what he would like least is a young Jewish boy working on his Devar Torah about his Parsha in the very place where Eichmann plotted the defeat uh, of the Jews. And, and so he, he wrote, um, I thought, a, a, a beautiful, I'm a little biased, but I thought it was a beautiful Devar Torah, and he gave it on Saturday. And basically, it had to do with the, with part of the Breshit, the, the, the first Parsha of, of the Torah. Um, he was lucky to get that one. And he talked about beginnings, and he, he, he came up with his own language, and he said, you know, the, this day when we open the Torah again for the 3,000th time, and this day when I get to read the Torah for the first time, it's all about beginnings. There are people who tried to stop us from doing this, and the people who tried to physically rid the world of us, but they have failed, and so we get to do this again, and we get to do it in, in, in happiness and freedom. And I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a wonderful and profound moment. And, and again, like a lot of other things in Jewish history, it gives me a lot of hope. And I thank you very much for listening to me. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, Please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.